We're thankful Jesus gave his life for each of us today. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? And I'm going to ask Dale Thompson to pray for us today. I'm glad you're here. You glad you're here? Amen. 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 Anybody need a hug today? You know, it's one of those days. Is anybody? I saw a couple of hands kind of go like this. Well, all of you stand and greet everybody around you today. It's good to see you today. Praise you. 
this chorus in just a moment we sing it again you make your way down front if you have a prayer need in your life be here at the altar be on the front pew just come seeking for God to do something in your life ask him to to do what only he can do and as we pray I want you to pray for one of our members Kent Love uh, he's been in the hospital and uh, the rehab center for almost 15 weeks now. And I uh, told him the other day when I visited him that we would pray for him specifically this morning. Continue to pray for Janice Allen. Uh, pray for uh, Philip Brownell. Uh, he told me this week that he went to the doctor and there's no sign of cancer in his life. So... That, that, that's a praise the Lord. And then, of course, pray for Brother Jeff and his family as they make the transition here to be with us at Hillwood. What a glorious day that was last Sunday and for the future as we ask God to do something in our lives. I read something this week. I wrote it down. I wanted to share with you this morning. I trust that it'll just sink into your life. Just listen. Listen to the words. Help me want the healer more than the healing. Help me want the Savior more than the saving. Help me want the giver more than the giving. Oh, help me want you, Jesus, more than anything. Make me a servant. That are up front. I do want to mention that Jill Crosby is going to have eye surgery. So we need to be in prayer for Jill as she has this upcoming eye surgery. So come and join around these that are here and pray for them. Father, as we come before you for the needs that we've mentioned, 
Kent Love, Janice Allen, for Philip, the thanks for the erase, erasure of cancer and for Brother Jeff and his family as they make this transition. We pray your blessings on these and we pray for these who are down front that you'd especially touch them with your Holy Spirit, your grace and your mercy. Lord, it becomes trite sometimes for us to even say this, but there really is nothing too hard or big or difficult for you. You are God, and we are not. So God, I pray today for your interaction in these lives. And for all of us here in this worship center, and even those who are watching by way of Facebook, I pray today that you would you would invade that space that each of us are in. That as we seek after you, we would find you, your love and your grace in such a full way this day. It's not about us, it's about you. So Lord, move in all of our lives today. And for that, we would be thankful, we would be grateful. And we say a hearty amen because Lord, we want you to be glorified, not only in this place, but in each of our lives. So thank you for each person here. Go with us this day that each of us would be that beacon, that shining light for you in a world that needs light. We love you. We thank you. We praise you in advance for hearing us, for healing, for comfort, and yes, for saving. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 God is good. And all the time. Well, we're going to sing a song that has the words in it. Who can satisfy my soul but you, Lord? So if you would, stand once again and help us to sing this song as we praise you. Who can satisfy my soul? Love me like you do. Who could ever be more faithful? True, Lord, I will trust in you. Lord, I will trust in you, my God. Living water. Trust in you, Lord, I will trust in you, my God. There is a fountain, who is a king, victorious warrior, and Lord of everything, my rock, my shelter.
offering this morning. Let's thank God for that and ask him to bless it. Father, thank you today for loving us. And thank you for this time of our giving back. Lord, use it. We want you to be glorified in this place. And I pray that you would take this, our gifts of love to you. And Lord, reach the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Got such good singers and good ministers of music and good instrumentalists in this place. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel the updraft of the Holy Spirit of God. I feel His presence in this place, and He is. It's a holy place. This is holy ground. And you do this all the time. You say, God is good, and you say all the time, and then I say all the time, and you say God is good. Let's try something. I'm going to say praise God, and you say all the time. And then I'm going to say all the time, and you say praise God. And we're going to do it with gusto, okay? Praise God. All the time. All the time. Amen. That's good, isn't it? That's good. That's good. You called you a pastor. First time in a long, long time. Hillwood has had a different pastor, another pastor. And that's good. That's good. Transition is coming. And God is going to do great things in your midst. I know that he is. And being one who's had the experience of moving in to a new place where I knew nothing, couldn't get to the post office, couldn't get to the hospital, couldn't do anything until somebody got in the car, and they did here at the church, and they took me to those places where I would be going first. And I learned my way there, and then after that learned my way to other places, and that's the way it is when you move into a new place. So your new pastor is going to be that way. He's not going to automatically know where to go eat every Sunday. Mm-hmm. You got the point, didn't you? <laughs> oh, me. I thank God for what he has done. I thank God for my time here. And we'll be with you two more Sundays until the time in which he's going to move in, I think, on the first of next, next month, uh, if I'm correct about that, hopefully. But I just praise God for what he has done and what he's going to do. Every church needs a pastor. And Hillwood has been without one now for a year and a half. I can't believe I've been here at the end of this month for a year and a half. And I began preaching right before Brother Charles got so sick and passed away and went to be with the Lord. But it seems like it has been so swift. And time has just passed so quickly during that time. And I look at that and count it up and I can hardly believe it. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, we find a passage that's one of my life verses and probably is one of yours. The 21st verse says, For He made Him, He is God, made Him Jesus, who knew no sin. Now, Jesus is God the Son. He's the sinless Son of God, God's beloved Son. And He was without sin in every respect. He was without the sin that would separate Him from the Father. He was without the sins that people commit. And he never had sin, and he never had sins in his life. He was Jesus, the Son of God. And this who we're talking about right now is our Savior. He's the one who's made it possible for us to get to heaven. So he, God, though, for us, because of the great love that he had for us, his only Son came and reveal to the world what God is like because He put Himself in a flesh where people could understand Him and where we can understand the words that He's left us. And He's placed His Holy Spirit in us where we can understand Him. And He, God, had to make His Son. He had to. He was the only one that could pay the S-I-N debt, the separation from God debt thing that caused us to be hopeless and on our way to hell, and there was no way to miss it. But God said, no, I'm going to provide the way. And He sent Jesus, fully knowing Jesus did as He grew up. He fully knew what was going to transpire in His life. In heaven, He was ready to come. And on earth, He was ready to do what God wanted Him to do. You remember, He prayed, nevertheless... When he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, take this from me if it could be your will, but nevertheless, 
Thy will be done. That's what every prayer ought to be like that we pray to God. We can ask Him for anything, any want, our needs are met. We can ask Him for any want that we have, and we can say to Him, oh Lord, this is my want, and this is what I would desire to be, but if it can't be, nevertheless, Your will be done in my life. This is our Savior whom God sent that we might become, he, may be, he became, He was made sin. I don't understand everything that that means, except that I know He was the only one who could pay the sin debt of the world for everyone who would ever live. And when He died on the cross, our sin debt was made arrangements for, and as we place our faith and our trust in Him, then He becomes our sin because He became our sin. And we have the forgiveness of sins that we might become the righteousness of God and it's in Him. When the Bible talks about being in Him, it's simply saying this could never be unless God made arrangements for it to be, but it is because of Jesus Nothing we could do, nothing we could make happen in our life, God does it because of Him. But there's so many things in the Bible, so many places in the Bible where it says, in Jesus, and it just simply means he's, He is the giver of it. He is the one who makes it possible. We know that we're made right in Him. We are made righteous. We are made holy. Jesus took our place down here. He clothed us in His righteousness. He took our hell down here that we might have His heaven up there when we die or at the rapture. But we must get reconciled to Him. And that's what He came to do, to make reconciled a lost world. We're balanced. We're made right. Just like you'd balance your checkbook and get it to agree with the bank. God help us if we can do that. I always, I always had so much problem with that. I finally turned it over to Ann, and she's been doing our book work for years, and that's where it's going to stay, too. I mean, she got all the money anyway. I mean, she ought to be keeping up with it. And uh, the money's hers. You know, I have to go get money from her. No, it's none of that's true. I'm just making that up. But I didn't mean to say that, honey. But we're reconciled to Him through the Son. We know that we have been made right with God. And you know, the one way that we know that we have been made right with God is because of His resurrection. For we know that if this earthly house of this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now when Paul is talking about our house, he's talking about our body. And he says there's something that we can know. Why? Because it's right here. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by, by men who wrote this and by His presence in us in the same way with Paul, he knew that what God had, had done was to make a place for us. First off, in our body because we house Him. But he says, we know there's something we can know because we have the Bible and the Holy Spirit. There's no doubt about it. There's no mistrust about it. You know, when doubt comes in, it's the devil. It's just the devil. If you ever ask God to forgive you of, of, of a sin and, and you just, I mean, it was just so bad. Any sin's bad, but it was just so bad and it made you feel so bad and you ask God's forgiveness and that, throughout the day, you thought about that again, and you just, oh, God, I'm going to ask your forgiveness again. And, and then the next morning, oh, God, I'm going to ask your forgiveness again. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if you haven't had faith for the forgiving. But let me tell you, when you go to God as a born-again child of God with the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, and you're convicted that you've sinned a sin, I don't know what it might, a sin as sins, it's to rob and to cheat and to steal and all that kind of thing. And you ask God to forgive you. I'm telling you because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, not because of you, because you're the righteousness of God in Him, not because of you. He forgives you. And Romans 8, 1 comes into play at that very point. Here's what God would say to you if you kept asking Him 
to forgive you of the same sin. Now, unless you commit it again, now you've got to go ask Him again if you do that. But if you've asked forgiveness, here's what He says. There is therefore now no, N-O, no, 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 no condemnation. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's saved people who've asked Him to forgive, asked Him forgiveness of His sin. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What is happening is you're you're letting yourself feel under condemnation if you've asked forgiveness of that sin. And that's from Satan. That's from Satan. So rebuke him and take the forgiveness and walk on. Because we are told in the Scripture, not just by Paul, but God preserved it. He's the one that gave it to him, told him to write it down. So God is speaking. We need to always remember that. We know that if our earthly house of this tent is destroyed, if we die, if, if we were destroyed some way, if in the military there are awful accidents, that not accidents, but there are awful tragedies that happen where... People are just no more. They're disintegrated because of what happened. But we die in this world and there's car wrecks and there's fires and there's all kinds of different things that happen. But if this earthly house die in a peaceful way or if it is destroyed in any other way, destroy means to cease to exist down here. We have a building. We have another body from God. A house not made with hands. God formed it like He forms Adam. He makes us a new body. Eternal in the heavens. When we die, we go in a twinkling of an eye into the presence of God, we find out over in Thessalonians. And we're with Him eternal in the heavens. We know this. And so we have in the resurrection a confirmation and a promise that we're made right in God and that that's our destination. And because of His resurrection, it is so. And so, we should have a desire, not only an assurance, but a desire and an eagerness to be with God in heaven. We ought to have a desire and an eagerness. I love my wife. I love my child, my one. I love my grandchildren, three of them. I love my two great-grandchildren. There are other people, of course, that I love in the Lord. And He wants us to know that He wants us as His child in heaven because heaven is our home. Revelation 21, 22, just read it. Read it about the new heaven and the new earth and how peaceful it's going to be, and how great it's going to be, and how wonderful it's going to be, and no crying, no tears, no problem, no bad health, no sirens, because nothing like that that ever has to raise to some, some tragedy somewhere will ever happen. You just have to go over there at Revelation 21, 22 and read about heaven frequently, folks. Because God wants us to desire to come home. We know this because of the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, told that parable. And that father had two sons. One of them took his part of the inheritance. You know the story. He went away. He wasted it with riotous living. He found himself feeding hogs in the hog pen. And they were eating some kind of old pods that only a hog would eat. And he was so hungry... He was thinking, I'd gladly eat that if I got permission to do it. He couldn't even get permission to eat the pods that the hogs were eating. And he said, my father's servants, my father, those who wait on him, got a place to live and a place to lay down at night and food to eat. And I've got nothing out here and I'm the son. I'm going home. I know I'm not worthy to be a son anymore, but I'm going to ask his forgiveness and tell him I just want to be one of his hired servants. And now he's coming home, and guess what? The whole time he's been gone, that father's been going out there every day, and he's been looking over the desert. And he's been looking for that son, and he's been looking for that son, and he's been looking for that son. And one day, he goes out there, and he looks, and he sees something about that big. And he continues to look at that, and it begins to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and he knows it's someone And now he's trying to figure out who it is and he's thinking, I see something familiar about that. And he gets closer and closer and he says, my son. And he doesn't wait, he runs to him and 
clasp his arms around him. And he welcomes him home and he brings him back to his house and he tells his servants, go get a robe, go get a ring and put on his finger, kill the fatted calf. We're going to make merry because this my son was lost and he's found again. He's come home. Now, have you ever been talking to someone and talking about spiritual things and God and the Bible and you've been just been talking about that kind of thing. And, and then maybe you say something about, well, you know, one day we're going to get to go to be with God in heaven and it can't be, you might, might say this, I, I can't wait. It can't be too soon for me. And this individual said, well, I'm a Christian. I know I'm going to heaven when I die, but I don't want to be on the next load. Why? Why? God's been waiting for us ever since we got saved. He wants us to serve Him in the intermediate because He's told us He does. But He's been waiting for us. He's been longing for us. He's been looking for us because heaven and its least thing that it has to offer is way better than the best thing that the world's ever thought about. And God is just waiting for you. Ever been, you ever spruced up the house and got a big meal waiting and everything has been prepared? It might even be Christmas time and gifts are around the tree and you've been involved in that, you know, for weeks, buying those presents and all of that and you're looking so hard for the family to come. You can't wait for them to be there. And you probably are looking, you know, about what time they're supposed to be there. They called you on the cell phone and now you're looking for them because you know that they're just around the corner. And you go outside to meet them and you bring them in and if they've got kids, you say, look at there, look at there. You've got stuff under the tree. And you wouldn't believe what your mama's cooked and put on the table. God's waiting for us to experience what He has for us. He's looking for us. He said so in that parable. We know because of the resurrection that God's heaven is there and that God's waiting on us and He was intensely, intensely desiring for us to be there. And don't you know you want your children to come home when they've been gone somewhere? He wants His children home with Him. Wouldn't He be hurt? Or wouldn't we be hurt? Of course, I live in town with my children now, and I'm glad of that. But wouldn't we be hurt if our child was living off somewhere and we heard through some way that they said, I know I need to go home, but I just, I just don't want to go right now. I don't want to make that trip. I could, but I'm not going to. Wouldn't that hurt us? Better to live our life in anticipation Better to live our life telling people about our anticipation. Who out there wants to join a God that someone is talking about is not anxious to get there and be with Him? Not many. Not many. Paul said, And by the way, we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. And if being clothed, we shall not be found naked. We're not going to be just a spirit floating around in heaven. We're going to look like this. But we're just going to be glorified. We're going to be like Jesus. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. What, we're say, what he's saying is, we're not going to be like this and don't want to be like this. We have too much problems in this, but we're going to be glorified. We're not going to be without a body. We left this body. We wore it out, but we've got a body that looks just like this. We're going to recognize each other, but we're going to have a body that looks just like this, but it's going to be glorified, and nothing bad can touch it of any kind. Mortality, death that we have to deal with down here will be swallowed up in life. And God's guarantee of that because of the resurrection is the Holy Spirit. He said, I've got to die. Jesus did. I, I'll spend a few days with you and I'm going away, but I'm coming back. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. 
He who prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. How do I know, brother? How do you know I'm going to heaven? Up here, I try to know it the best that I can, but it's the Holy Spirit that invades me from here to the bottom of my feet that guarantees me where heaven is. That's where God is, and that's where we're going as a born-again child of God. I can't explain all of it, but I just know because He said so, it's so, and we're going when we die. No one, you know, people can dispute anything you tell them. Hey, folks. I came over here in a Lexus this morning. Brand new, electric. You might believe that and you might not believe that. As a matter of fact, I didn't. I got the same old 2010 Equinox. But nobody, and, and people can dispute that. So you can dispute that because you, some of you probably saw me drive up. And you can dispute that. But when I tell you that I know, that I know, that I know, that I know, and something's happened to me, I got born again. You can't dispute that. You might want to, and, and if you dispute it, you'd be totally wrong because you can't dispute something that somebody said, this happened to me. Or God has confirmed this in me, and I know it. We have the confidence through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that heaven is there. So we're always confident, verse 6 says, knowing that while we're at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. In other words, what he's saying, I'm absent from the Lord. I'm at home in this body now, but heaven's up there. Paul said one day, I'd like to go. But he said, it's more expedient for me to stay here with you for a while. And it was because he did so much more. And God let him do that, but he had a lot of conflict in his life. Going home for a visit... This is what I used to hear in my hometown. We got ready to go. Well, y'all come when you can. And I'd say, well, we sure will. And I'd get halfway down the sidewalk, and I'd hear my mother say, call me. And I didn't do that enough, because I got wrapped up too much in what I was doing. I told her one day, though, I said, Mama, those lines run in both directions. But see, I was a son. I was supposed to call her, and that's true. I believe that. I did not, I didn't enough. We know we've been made right with God because of the resurrection. We know we've been made right with God because of the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ is what causes us to want to live a pleasing life for God down here. People who, excuse me now, people who gripe and complain and find something wrong about everything and it's too hot here and it's too cold there and it may be. We all have different temperaments. I understand that. But it's, it's too, got too much air in it here and it hasn't got enough air in it there. You know, it, it should be this way and not that way. We are to come together in the unity of the faith when we're at church. We are to agree on what the Lord leads us to do. And you did that last Sunday. And Jeff's coming in, Brother Jeff, excuse me, is coming in with an assurance that everybody is on board with this church experience. And what's going to happen here? And he's going to do his job as a pastor, and Brother Dan is going to show him all the eating places and how to get where he needs to go. I'd expect that if I was coming in. Amen, brother. But he's coming in, and he's going to need help, but you're going to be unified in that because... Not solely because you called him, but because of God. And that God's called him into the ministry. But he's called you to come together with him in the unity of the faith. To be one as Jesus Christ is with God. And God with Jesus. That's a tall command, but you can do that in the Lord. 
There's only one way to do it in some instances. Back when my daughter was living with us, I remember a specific time in Macomb, Mississippi, and something had happened, and I'd gotten a little rolled up about it, and it concerned her some way or other. I don't remember what it was. It doesn't matter anyway. But I was talking to her about it, and she was sitting there on the couch, and I kind of got in my preaching mode, which I do too much at home, but uh, I finally, she sensed that I got to the end of my sermon. And I turned around to go out the door to go over to the church, and she took a big risk. She said, now she was already going to college locally at the junior college there, but she said, you're just mad because you know I'm right. <laughs> and you know what? All the way through that sermon I preached to her, God kept saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. You know you're wrong. I said, you're wrong. And I'd get louder. I, 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 I got time now talking to my daughter. You're wrong, you're wrong. And I got through with that sermon. I turned around and I thought, I thought something like, uh, I, don't, I shouldn't have. And, and about that time, she said that. And I got two choices now. Normally, I would have turned around and I preached her another sermon. But God convicted me and I turned around and I said, you know what, Lee? You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And I conceded to my college-age daughter because she was right. Sometimes some of these young people will say something and we might not want to say yes to that, but we know they're right. We need to come together in the unity of the faith and say, yes, you're right. I'll support you in that. Help me to understand why you like it like that. Sometimes we'll say something to someone and they have the same situation and, and you want to be right but as you start having a conversation with that person God will begin to convict you and you'll begin or at least I start, I start thinking mm, maybe they are right about what they're saying I've had tear up a few sermons that I preached thankfully it's been a long time ago hadn't been any since I preached them to you okay but, you know, you learn and you grow as you go along. But if the church is going to get along, go along. Don't go along the wrong way. You don't have to do that. This man is not going to lead you that way, though. But go along. Well, I don't know if I'm going to like this or not. Well, you will if you go along and come together in the unity of the faith. I saw a picture of a bunch of geese one day. And here you had this long line and short line. I had a guy ask me one time when I was out visiting with, with him. He said, Brother, do you know why one of those lines of geese is shorter than the other? And I knew this man, and, and I said, he's going to give me some philosophical something, and it's going to take him 15 minutes to tell me. And I, I just said, no, I don't. Why? He said, well, one line's shorter than the other. We can learn something. Sometimes we think that something ought to be a lot more complicated than it is. But it's not. And if we'll go along, we'll find out that the complication dissipates and the understanding comes in. But it takes unity. It takes unity. The Corinthian church had all kinds of problems. But they began to conform to what God wanted them to do. Let me just quickly say to you that one other way that we can know that we've been made right with God is because love energizes us. To talk about <clears throat> what is in our heart and not the world. To tell people, <clears throat> excuse me, I sometimes wonder if my preaching is coming to a close. Uh, I hope not. 
For we, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not heart. Paul was saying, it's not the outside that counts, it's the inside. And we need to learn who people are and where they're coming from. The love of God compels us. When we have God, we love Him more and more. We have purpose in life. I'm not going to read all these scriptures. But we're just not the same. There shouldn't be after we're saved. I haven't, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't gone to a Southern Baptist convention or a state convention in a while. I retired in 2014. I'm a little out of the loop. I could go, but I just haven't gone. But business, <clears throat> business meetings and those places are just like ours, but they're different in the fact that there's usually always, not always, but a lot of times, some, a lot of different opinions to what we're trying to do. And people have their say. And then we vote. And when the voting is done, whichever way it went, that's it because we cast the ballot under the inspiration of God most of the time. And that's the way we do in the church and we depend on God. And God's going to bring a man in here <clears throat> that you unanimously voted for. I'm just saying, get behind him, get on the side of him, get in front of him. I used to go back here in this room and uh, Brother Charles and I came back from a conference in Jacksonville one time and we talked about it on the way home and we got convicted about, about it. And so we, we need to get together right before we pray and we need to have somebody pray for us. And we'd sit down, whoever was bringing the message and the deacons would be back there and it would take a lot of time. It'd just be one would voice a prayer usually, and they lay hands on us. And I'm telling you, when we came to the pulpit to preach, it wasn't like other times. It wasn't, no matter what was going on with us. And I thank God so much for that. Not telling you to start that up. You do what you do as God leads you to do it. I'd have loved some time for about six or seven of those deacons to get around me when I was coming out from the office to come in to the auditorium. I never did tell anybody, but I'd have just loved for them to walk up to the pulpit with me. Or up maybe right here. I don't know. Brother Jeff might not even want you to do that. Might not be a need. But I'm just saying, what God tells you to do, do that. And be unified about it. And if, and if you can't see it at first, if the majority is saying, I know God wants us to do this, walk in that and you'll come to the unity of the faith. I promise you that you will. I had to turn around and tell my daughter, you're exactly right. I never had done anything like that in my life. But from that point forward, I found myself in the same situation <clears throat> and there were several times that I had to do that before she married and got out of the house. And I had to do it with Ann. I'd never done it with her exactly like that. But sometimes if we do what God's telling us to do, that's what we'll have to do. And we can know that we've been made right with God because it's the Holy Spirit in us that's leading us in that direction. Bow your heads, please. <clears throat> Father, th thank you for this time together today. If there's one here who's not come to the place where they know Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray that they would repent of their sin and ask you to be their Lord and Savior right now. And then I pray, Father, if they pray that prayer, that as I come down to the front in just a moment, that they come forward and just share that with me and let me share it with the church. 
there's someone here who needs to move their letter, I pray they do so. There's someone, Lord, who just needs to have a quiet time and a prayer time with you where they are. I pray, Lord, they'd not be hindered by anybody, but that they just do that. <clears throat> we'll give you the glory, Lord, for what you have done and are doing and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You come if you need to come. Let's stand, please. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence. Brother Robert today, would you? Amen. Let me remind you, a call to prayer tonight at 6 o'clock and our activities on Wednesday night. I trust that you'll have a great week and you'll be able to share Jesus with those you come in contact with. Don Reisman is coming to lead us in our closing prayer. Would you bow with us as we pray together? Heavenly Father, how we thank you for everything you've done in our lives. We thank you for what you've accomplished in our church. We thank you for so many things, Lord, and a wonderful pastor that's going to come and lead us. We just give you thanks for that, Lord. I pray that you would be with him and his family as they move. Pray that the help will be available to help them in the move, keep them safe in the highways. And Lord, help us to be the kind of church body that we need to be to support him and pray for him and to love him. Lord, I pray for Ron Lynch's wife uh, Tuesday who is going to have surgery. I pray for Jill's eye surgery that's coming. But I thank you, Lord, for uh, instruments of praise. Thank you for Philip Brunel's uh, elimination of the cancer that he had. Thank you so much for that, Lord. I thank you for working in Gary's life and uh, uh, working and guiding him and uh, the blessings of joy that he has received recently. Forgive me, Lord, where I haven't, where I've failed you, haven't done what I need to do or been offensive to someone. Forgive me. Just thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bless you.